morning. It is 10 a.m. on Thursday, and that means it's time for us to study God's Word together. We thank you for joining us live, and anyone that joins us later on to watch this on Facebook or on our YouTube channel. Uh, we thank you for joining us, particularly uh, we thank the members of the Historic Second Baptist Church here in Bay City, Michigan. I hope everyone is doing well. hope everyone is healthy. Uh, I've been encouraged thus far with uh, those of you who I've spoken to um, that so far that everyone is doing well, everyone is healthy. We will continue to pray uh, that that is the case. Uh, we thank God for how he has uh, blessed us thus far and even how he will continue to bless us. Now, well, again, it's Thursday at 10 a.m., and so it is time for us to open God's Word together. Uh, but before we do that, good morning, Sister Beatty. Before we do that, um, have a couple of announcements, um, particularly for the membership of Second Baptist, also for anyone else who is joining us. Um, on uh, Sunday, uh, it is the first Sunday of the month, and as is our tradition, in obeying the scriptures, uh, we will um, participate in the Lord's Supper. So we do ask that you have your water or grape juice um, and your crackers or your bread um, ready on Sunday with your families at home uh, such that we can celebrate the Lord's Supper together. We will do that uh, immediately following the sermon and before the benediction on Sunday. So again, we will have uh, the Lord's Supper communion on Sunday. Uh, Second Baptist members, please share with other members and remind them that we will be doing that uh, from home. So again, have your water, your grape juice, your bread, or your crackers, and we will celebrate the Lord's Supper together virtually. Secondly, since it's 2020, uh, I am encouraging everyone, if you have not already, to please, ma'am, please, sir, complete your census. It is uh, important for us to complete and participate in every 10 years in general because it determines the information that is gathered uh, based on those population statistics. That is how federal and state monies are determined, how they will be used, what they will be used for, where they will be used, uh, as well as other resources in our communities, uh, where they will be used, how they will be used. That also includes um, where stores are built, how those stores are um, uh, stocked with certain items and things of that nature. So as you can tell just from that, and it's more to it as well, it is very important for us to participate in completing the census. This year, there's more importance with it given this global pandemic uh, and this plague that we are in the midst of because uh, as we discussed on Sunday, um, God is concerned about how we come out of this, how we come through this. And that's important. The resources and the distribution of those resources are important. And then also congressional seats. Uh, of course, we know that uh, the upcoming elections are important. Yes, November, um, but also um, further than that. And these statistics are going to determine the representation we have in our politics and we know that we need to have uh, the right representation so that the right laws are put in place, enforced, uh, such that everyone can have their needs met. And so please, ma'am, please, sir, complete your census. I see some other people have joined us. Good morning, Sister Watson. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone else that is coming in. I don't want to start naming our names because then uh, that'll take forever. We're so grateful that you're joining with us. Uh, so again, we will have communion on Sunday, and please, ma'am, please, sir, complete your census. If you know someone that you can help complete the census, do that as well. Uh, it may be as simple as calling on the phone, uh, them having the information up on their computer or the application in front of them. You have an application in front of you to kind of walk them through that. But please, ma'am, please, sir, complete your census. Make sure everyone you know is encouraged as well to complete their census. All right, it's time for us to get right into Bible study. So let's pray uh, before we get into it. 
Gracious God, we thank you for this opportunity to hear from you and to engage you in your word. We ask that your presence be with us. Open our hearts, open our minds, open our souls to hear what you want us to hear in this time that you've blessed us to have together. Help us to learn what you want us to learn and then put it into practice as well. Give us opportunities to do so. Give us opportunities to uh, share with others what we have learned and what we have discussed such that your will can continue to be done on earth as it is in heaven. We thank you and we praise you. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, today's topic is hospitality. Uh, hospitality is something that um, if we're Christian, many of us are familiar with. In fact, I would say all of us are familiar with. Uh, I was born in Louisiana. The, all of my family is from Louisiana. Much of my extended family uh, either is from the South or their families were originally in the South. And so uh, I'm in a practical sense familiar with that term, Southern hospitality. Um, and Southern hospitality is great in terms of how we're fed, how we share stuff, you know, everybody has sweet tea, um, you know, certain dishes are cooked certain ways that uh, people in the South are, are used to. And Southern hospitality is great. Uh, however, if that's all we strive for, we can uh, miss the mark because hospitality is all throughout scripture. Uh, in our day and time, uh, globalization um, and how we really are in a small world uh, emphasizes this importance for hospitality. We can talk to somebody all across this country, all across this world with the touch of a button. If someone is in another country right now, they could choose to join us in Bible study and we could be sharing and reading and studying God's word all over the world right now. And that is a blessing. Uh, there are some things with technology that we can uh, say our abuses, but that is a use of technology that we can connect with people all over the world at any given second. In the same way that should heighten our senses, uh, that as we sort of talked about last week in Bible study with honoring our bodies and how everybody matters, is that uh, we are connected to every other human on this planet and every other organism on this planet. And so we should be able to extend hospitality and thought in words and in deeds to all people. Uh, and then we have this diversity. Uh, we, uh, unfortunately, there are still some strands of racism among the other isms, that there are some uh, people who think uh, that one race is more important than the other, better than the other. There are some people who uh, believe God favors certain races over others, and that's just not the case. That's not in scripture or otherwise. And so uh, we have this diversity and we should embrace this diversity. We should be uh, grateful that a diverse God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has also blessed us with diversity uh, in terms of all of our ethnicities. And not only ethnicities, even if you have people of the same ethnicities in the same room, all of them are diverse because all of the people in the room are not going to have the same interests, not going to have the same passions. Um, not going to like the same thing, not even going to like all of the same foods and things of that nature. So again, uh, there's this diversity that we've been richly blessed with and we should embrace as opposed to, in some senses, uh, in our day and time, really throughout human history, uh, there has been uh, confrontations and some friction between the races as, instead of there being embracing of it. And so today we're going to uh, look at some places in scripture first and foremost about um, how that took place and even the blessing of embracing people um, and not necessarily coming up with stranger danger but embracing all people the ways now uh, before we get there uh, we do have to have some discernment we do have to be aware uh, we do have to be um, uh, in some ways we can be aware enough to be protective of our friends and family and of ourselves in certain situations uh, we have to have discernment, but we shouldn't just uh, block people out out of fear uh, because what can happen is we can be fearful and we can set ourselves up to miss out or delay God's blessings uh, by not being open to people of different ethnicities, people from different places in the world, people from different parts of uh, the country and things of that nature. So we're going to go into scripture uh, and see what some of those things say. 
Uh, and then we're also going to talk about some examples of, of acts of hospitality. With the verses of, with the passages of scripture we look at, as well as the acts of hospitality, they're not exhaustive. There will be, there are more places in scripture than what we'll talk about today that discuss and encourage hospitality. There are also um, more acts of hospitality than what we'll get into. So let's define hospitality. And good morning, everyone. I see you all chiming in. Grateful that you're with us for this conversation. Uh, people all over the country. I see, I see my cousin Apollo, I see Miss Wiley, I see Sister Davis. Um, I saw some other people come in, so thank you so much for joining us. Here is the definition of hospitality. The friendly and generous reception and entertainment of guests, visitors, or strangers. Again, the friendly and generous reception and entertainment of guests, visitors, or strangers. A lot of us know that uh, somebody in our family, I think all of us know this, um, that when people come over to the house, you got to clean up. Now, um, it's another Bible set for another time, but if we're not already cleaned up, that's a whole other conversation. But when people come to the house, you clean up, you straight up, you straighten up. Um, there are some of us whose family has uh, certain dishes that are only used when visitors come. Um, certain other things we only pull out when visitors come, certain other things we only even play with when visitors come. And that is a part of hospitality too. Um, but it's interesting uh, that we have those practices. But um, what's interesting is that not only the generous reception of uh, visitors, guests, and strangers, but also the entertainment of. Um, and you know, there are certain things that we have uh, during the holidays that we do with our family. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing that we have those uh, opportunities. And hopefully as we have this conversation, we don't only share that with our biological family, uh, but even as our families grow, uh, as we're a part of churches and things of that nature, we continue to uh, come up with ways to be friendly and generous to other people. So again, let's just go into the Bible. I'm not going to uh, read all of the passages, but we are gonna talk about them in some generalities. Uh, Facebook doesn't want to let us be great. You know, they keep, uh, after about 50 minutes, they shut us down off of Bible study. It goes out the last two weeks. So what we're gonna do, I'm gonna try to be more disciplined and just talk about these in generalities. The handouts are available on the website. I encourage you to go and look at them and download it. And please read these passages of scriptures uh, in their entirety. Again, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to. So let's see what the Bible says about strangers, guests, and hosts. In Genesis chapter 18, uh, Abraham is sitting outside um, at the, at near the entrance of uh, he and Sarah's home. And there are three men that come up to him. And he has a conversation. He embraces them. And he and Sarah host them. Um, and in their culture, that was particularly important. When someone comes up to you or comes to your home, uh, you embrace them, you feed them, you give them something to drink. And he did this. And a blessing that they received is that was God sending some messengers, probably some angels, to let them know that the promise that he had given Abraham that they were going to have children uh, was going to come to pass. He did not give them a timeline, but he did tell them it was going to come to pass. So... What is the one takeaway here is sometimes there are people that God sends to us that we've never met. And there are some times where we'll have conversations and God will speak to us, give us some sort of confirmation. Uh, maybe we are concerned about something and we may receive a word from God through people we don't know. And when we hear that, we'll be able to discern clearly that it's from God. There will be some sense of peace that comes with it. Some scripture will come to mind or what have you, but we'll know that that's God speaking to us. And what can happen is uh, sometimes, and particularly in our culture with everything that's going on in our world and has been going on in our world in human history, um, unfortunately, we can meet other people, see them in the store, see them outside, don't want to speak to them, or they speak to us and we get uh, uncomfortable or we get upset. Why are you looking at me? Why are you speaking to me? And what can end up happening is we can miss out on God giving us a word, we can miss out on a blessing, or we can delay it because we got a bad attitude. And that is a bad attitude. We don't want to speak to people. 
We don't want to embrace people. We don't want to be friendly. That's a bad attitude. And what can happen, again, we can miss out on blessings and we can, either, we can even delay blessings. Just imagine what might have happened with Abraham and Sarah. They were already old. They were already in their 80s or 90s uh, when this happened. And God had made a promise that was going to happen to them. And then it was confirmed with these gentlemen coming to visit them. And it's important to be, be nice to people when we see them, to be embracing, to speak, even to people that are not nice to us. Uh, and the word or words that I've heard first and foremost from Sister Sharon Floyd, it's just nice to be nice. And when we're nice, uh, oftentimes there may be people that have been upset. I've had this happen to me. I speak to somebody else and they initially seem to be uninterested and they can end up, end up being nice too and saying, you know what, I'm sorry. I've been having a bad day, but thank you for speaking. Thank you for being nice. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for doing that. And so we never know how that might happen. So we embrace people when they come. Leviticus 19, 33 and 34 is a second passage uh, that we want to look at. I am going to read those two verses. Uh, Leviticus is a book that is concerned with holiness. Uh, it's a lot of laws, a lot of... Um, a lot of things in there that seem interesting and, and, and confusing at times. But the, the thrust of the book of Leviticus really is about holiness and the, the sincerity and the seriousness we should take in approaching a holy God. All of us know that God is holy and we should interpret Leviticus as well as the rest of the Bible based on the finished work of Christ. And so there are some um, laws in there that are no longer directly applicable to us, but everything in there has something, some meaning into, uh, some meaning for us uh, that is applicable in our lives. But let me read verses 33 and 34. And I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. And there's an interesting word that is used here. Uh, and I'll say more about it in just a second. Verses 33 and 34 of Leviticus chapter 19 say this. When an alien resides with you in your land, you should not oppress the alien. The alien who resides with you shall be to you as a citizen among you. You shall love the alien as yourself, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Recently had a friend of mine, I'm not gonna say his name, uh, cause I know he's probably gonna watch later. Um, but he recently asked me, why does the Bible talk about aliens if we've never found them? And, and that was funny, but that's a good question because the word alien is in scripture. Now, I know the government just released uh, some of some video. I haven't seen them yet, but I heard the, early, the, the government just released some videos, some UFOs and things like that. Uh, I think they're releasing that as trying to be a distraction from some other stuff going on. Uh, so I'm just saying that as a side note, be careful. Uh, some of this stuff that's being released because they're releasing this right now on purpose. I'm just going to say that there. Uh, but this here is not talking about aliens on Mars or another planet or in some of these other galaxies. Um, this here is in reference to, um, number one, the experience that the Israelites has in Exodus that we're kind of talking about contextually on Sundays. They were oppressed and marginalized as slaves in Egypt for hundreds of years. And a part of this is they were in a country that they were not familiar with, that they were not embraced in. And God wanted to remind them that you know how it felt. And if you yourself does not, if you heard the story, you read the stories, you know how your ancestors were taught, were treated, I'm sorry. And you didn't like how they were treated, so don't treat anybody how they were treated. And this oppression and marginalization, they were not given what they needed to be given just as people. They were treated as less than people. And what God was reminding them of, don't treat another person as less than a person because all people are equal in God's eyes. Even the Old Testament context, in God's eyes, all people were equal because although we see this recurring theme about the Israelites being God's chosen people, God's chosen people, there were people of other ethnicities and races that were embraced and brought into the community and they became believers themselves, okay? So it says that about aliens and strangers. We hear near the beginning of the Bible, God telling them, embrace people that are outside of your 
your community. Embrace people of other ethnicities. Embrace people and treat people the right way simply because they're people. Because in God's eyes, all people are the same. And so in our eyes, all people should also be the same. Okay? Now let's go to the New Testament, Luke 10, 38 to 42. Uh, I'm not going to read that one either because that's a familiar story. That's when Jesus is at Mary and Martha's house. And Mary and Martha have two different responses to Jesus. Um, actually, I'm going to look at it. Um, just to make sure I don't mix up the two um, who were sitting at Jesus' feet. One was sitting at his feet and one was um, was working in the house. And Jesus tells them to um, tells them what they need to be doing. Now, so it says Mary was sitting at his feet and Martha was distracted and she was working. Neither of them were wrong per se. One of them was just doing what was better in the moment. That is, there are some moments where we do need to serve Jesus and serve people. But it's also sometimes we need to sit our happy selves down and just listen. And to take a break and to hear what God is saying and to observe what God is doing. And that's, you know, that Ecclesiastes 3 passage about is a time for this, a time for that. And we have to know when the time for this and time for that. One of our sessions in this Bible study is actually going to be about saying no and saying yes. And it's important to know when to say yes and when to say no. Who to say yes to, who to say no to. Because that, that provides some healthy boundaries in our lives. And so in this passage, Martha was not wrong for serving. Martha was not wrong for trying to set up stuff. But she was about to miss out on what was important. So again, we have to have that discernment to know uh, when to do what and even how to do what it is God has called us to do. Because sometimes Jesus wants to be our host. There are other times uh, we are to host Jesus in a sense. And we'll get to that with this last passage in Hebrews. Um, but in that scene, Jesus was telling Martha, right now is not the time for you to be running around the house working trying to serve other people. Right now, I need you to, to sit down and listen. There are other times that we do need to be moving and serving, but there are also some times where we need to sit down. So again, we have to have that balance of knowing when to host as, hosp as hospitality, but also knowing when we're being hosted. That's also a piece of hospitality. There's sometimes we can go in somebody's house and they have uh, prepared a meal for us, uh, they have prepared something else for us. And instead of us just being there and enjoying it, we're trying to do stuff. It's nothing wrong. It's good home training to offer uh, to help wash the dishes or to offer to do this or to do that, depending upon the situation. But if people say, no, I got it. I just wanted you to come over and I wanted your presence. I wanted you to relax. Then relax. Sit there, be quiet, be still watch the movie, watch the game, play Scrabble, whatever it is that you're doing, it's okay if someone is hosting you to be hosted. Now, if you want to host them, then you all can have come to some agreement about you hosting them. But it's okay sometimes to be hosted, to be the guest. That's being hospitable as well. There will become a time again where you will be the host and they will be the guest as well, okay? Now, in John chapter 2, we have a situation that that happens, and Jesus shows us this. Jesus is at uh, someone's wedding. We don't know whose wedding it is. We don't know his relationship. Uh, but weddings then were something to, to really be a part of. Weddings lasted up to seven days. I mean, and they, they had a great time. They, they partied. They, they, uh, uh, and, and this ain't going to happen in heaven. So they, they ate, drank, and they were married. Now, Jesus is at this wedding, and they run out of wine. And this is a major boo-boo, a major faux pas in this culture. Because if you ran out of wedding, they were never going to forget that you and your family didn't have everything you need to be good hosts. And not only have everything that they needed, but having quality, um, quality wine, quality food. They were going to talk about it. That's just like uh, most of us remember certain people's weddings and their receptions, whether or not we enjoyed them, right? 
it's the same similar uh, process in terms of they were getting ready to run out of wine, and so they was gonna be the family that people was whispering about and pointing about in their community that they ran out of wine and they weren't able to be good hosts. So Mary comes to Jesus and asks Jesus to bail them out. Jesus seems to resist at first, but he does come around, and not only does he turn water into wine, but this is the best wine that they'd ever had. This was not grape juice. This was not um, um, something else. This was real deal wine, okay? So Jesus makes this wine, and they, they were surprised at how good it was, uh, and they continue having a good time. And this was the first of the miracles that Jesus performed. Now, to say all that to say, when people, we should give our best when we're the host. And we should be grateful when people give us their best when they host. The other part of this is, um, there are times when we meet people, we uh, are in the company of people, and we think that in that situation, we're the person that God has sent in that situation to be a blessing when in fact, it's the other person. Again, we kind of talked about this when in Genesis 18, when uh, those three people came, those three men came to Abraham and Sarah's place. But we have to be sensitive in certain moments and certain conversation because there may be a portion of the conversation that even though we came in with one expectation, what God has planned and what God has designed is something else. We can go in expecting to be the host when in fact we're going to be the person being hosted and receiving a blessing. And that's just all a matter of discernment, all a matter of being sensitive to the Holy Spirit such that we can see I'm coming to do this, but that's not exactly what's working out. And so then we have to kind of have that, uh, that patience and we have to shift and allow people uh, allow the situation to be what God wants us to be. We know this, in those of us who go to church, we know sometimes we go to church and we go in and we don't want to do anything but hear the sermon. But then the spirit moves and, and there's just singing and there's dancing and that's how the spirit chooses to move. On the other side of that, sometimes we're not really into you know the singing and, and some other Parts of worship are not great, but then the message and the sermon is just awesome. It's just great. And so we have to just be sensitive to there are different times and different ways that the Spirit moves. And sometimes with the host, sometimes with the guest and the stranger. Okay? Hebrews 13, 1 through 3. I'm only going to talk about verse 2. And verse 2 says there are times when we can entertain angels. We can entertain Jesus and not know it. I'm going to go to it. Uh, just to read it, I want to make sure I read it correctly. Um, this is essentially our anchor scripture for today. Um, but Hebrews 2, he Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 2, I'll go ahead and read 1 through 3. It says, let mutual love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing that, some have entertained angels without knowing it. Okay? And then verse 3 talks about remembering those who are in prison as though you were in prison with them, those who are being tortured, as though you yourselves were being tortured. That's an important verse as well. We talked about that in depth on last week. But it's interesting that when we talk about hospitality, we talk about honoring our body, that in God's word, um, visiting prisoners and treating prisoners in the right way keeps coming up. And, and that kind of goes into the ways we should be considering the prison industrial complex. But to, to suffice it to say, with verse 2, it says, again, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some have entertained angels without knowing it. We never know whose presence we're in. We never know. We have to be, we have to be aware of that so that we're not rude to people, that we're not condescending to people, that we're embracing to people, that we're nice to people, because sometimes we can be talking to the person that God is using to bless us, and we can be rude and mean and not even realize who we're talking to and then we can miss out on the blessing or we could delay God's blessing because we got a bad attitude and a nasty mouth, okay? So it's important to be host. Now, I wanna say this statement of summation and then kind of look at a larger picture when, it, picture when it comes to hospitality. Xenos, the word that means stranger in Greek, 
also means guest and host. This one word signals the essential mutuality that is at the heart of hospitality. I'll say this, say that again. Xenos, the word that means stranger in Greek, also means guest and host. This one word signals the essential mutuality that is at the heart of hospitality. Now that's interesting because I know many of us are aware of the word xenophobia, that is fear of the stranger, and how that plays itself out, plays itself out in so many negative ways in our culture. We think about how um, with this coronavirus, how it was called the Chinese virus and the Chinese disease and how people in China are being talked about. When we look at 9-11 um, and Afghan the war in Afghanistan and uh, all of that that's been go that was going on, we see how people in the Middle East uh, were talked about and demonized and things of that nature. Um, and a lot of that was unfounded. But in the Greek language, the word that is used as stranger in the New Testament over and over is used interchangeably to mean stranger, guest, and host. That is because, as we've talked about with all five of these passages, we're all in this together at the end of the day. God created all of us. God loves all of us. God offers all of us salvation. God offers, he wants to meet all of everyone's needs. And so we are to be a part of God meeting those needs. And that's where this hospitality comes in. Again, Southern hospitality is great. Hospitality we receive in practicality is great. But when it comes to those of us who identify as Christians, from the beginning of the Bible, that's why we started in Genesis and we ended up in Hebrews, all throughout the Bible, hospitality is important. On a personal level, on a familial level, on a communal level, Hospitality is important. We should be embracing of everyone. We should not be just embracing the people we like. We should not embrace the people that agree with what we agree with or think like we think. We should be open and embracing of everyone because that is what the Bible calls us to do. Okay? So, this hospitality, again, the definition we started with is the friendly and generous reception and entertainment of guests visitors and strangers i know we're in quarantine right now so number one be nice to the people in your house i know they probably getting on your nerves by now i know i'm getting on my wife's nerves sometimes i do it on purpose because i play too much but i know people in your house might be getting on your nerves but be nice to them we never want to do something something happens and we regret how we talk to people that we know and love and how we treated them be nice to the people in your house. Be nice to your family. Check on your family. If there are people uh, you have not checked on that God has blessed you to share DNA with, check on them today. Uh, church family. Check on your church family. And it, it just branches out in co-workers and you're part of certain organizations. Check on people. Be nice to them. See how they're doing. Uh, we know right now this, is, this, this uh, pandemic is impacting people uh, in terms of mental health, anxiety, and things of that nature. If we know people that experience that, check on them. Those are people we definitely have to embrace and be nice to. And not just now, but this should just be heightening our awareness of some of these practices. That's one of the reasons we're going through this series. There's some things that we should continue doing uh, even once this is over. But check on people. The times that we do go to the stores right now, be nice to people. Speak to people. Say, hello, how are you doing? They tell you have a good day, you tell them have a good day as well. That's a part of hospitality. Um, don't have road rage. Um, and then as this, as this, as we get, whenever we get back to normal when we're in stores and in places and we go somewhere at the gas station, just we never know, we never know how people uh, will embrace us being nice to other people. Again, it's just nice to be nice and hospitable. So here are just a list of, of uh, acts of hospitality. Again, it's not exhaustive. These are just some uh, that I know are, are good and important, and there are others, okay? So we have generational care. We should make sure we take care of everyone that is in our family and everyone that we know from the babies to our grandparents, great-grandparents, and all of that. We're going to talk about this more next week when it comes to household economics. But we should have generational care. Uh, one of the things that came to mind, I was listening to the radio yesterday, listening to the news, 
and it talked about how there are people uh, in nursing homes and in these extended care facilities that are being impacted by this coronavirus quite a bit, and we know that it's spreading. Um, let's make sure that we don't just send our parents and grandparents to nursing homes, that we don't just send them there because we don't want to uh, take care of them and spend the time with them. I'm not saying that, that anyone on may have done that. I just want to encourage it because there are times when we just send people away and we don't want to take care of them. Uh, we don't want to invest in taking care of them. I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about time, attention, and our presence. And we just send people away. We just try to put them somewhere and we don't do what's best. I'm hoping and praying that this time also heightens us to the relationships that God has blessed us to have with family in terms of blood, extended family, church family, and otherwise. Um, please take care of the babies, take care of our generation, take care of the generations in front of us. Spend time with your grandparents, spend time with your great grandparents if you're living. Trust me, my biological grandparents are no longer here on earth. I would love to call them and go see them. And I'm grateful that I can still go visit, visit their house and things of that nature that, that God blessed them with and has blessed our family with. And because I sat at their feet, there are times where I still hear their voices and things that they taught me. They taught me how to farm. They taught me how to fish and hunt. And, and given what's going on right now, I'm glad that if, if stuff continues to progress and gets worse, I'm going to be able to do some stuff to, to provide for my family and others. Because uh, we should know how to do stuff. Plus, when we learn that things, and everyone that's on here, there's somebody in your family that knows how to garden, knows how to farm, knows how to hunt, knows how to fish knows how to do things that we won't have to depend on somebody else to have what we need. I guarantee you that. So call them, sit at their feet, ask them. You'll be surprised at how excited they'll be that you want to know about that part of our life. And if we think about it, those of us, anyone in this country, no matter what your, your demographic, we're really not that far removed from being in an agrarian society. So I know there's someone in our families that have this. So please, please take care of them. Learn from them. Listen to those stories. There's so much wisdom and practical application of being good people, you know, good people, but also being good Christians um, if we just talk to people in our families and have those conversations. Number two, sharing, not selling. Something that we should do is when we have been blessed by God, we should share what God has blessed us with and not sell it to other people. We should not be focused on profiting all the time. That's one of the issues that's being exposed in this coronavirus. Please, just because they open stuff up, don't run back outside and go to this stuff. It is not time. It's not safe. Listen to the, the medical professionals and the scientists, not some of these other people who are trying to profit and are focused on making money. When we, when we get stuff and when, when God blesses us with stuff, Give some stuff away to people. Give food away to people. Don't sell it to people. Uh, one thing my grandfather taught me again, when we went fishing, the fish we caught, we gave it to people. Our family ate, and if there were people we know that liked that fish or they came by their house and asked him if he'd been fishing, he would go in his freezer and give them fish. He never sold fish to other people. The same thing with the greens and the peppers and stuff that... He and my grandmother grew. They didn't sell it to people. They gave it to people. And that's something that stuck with me to this day. And I've been blessed because I have not tried to try to profit off of everything that I have when someone lets me know that they're in need or if they're in want. So I just want to encourage, and I think that's a part of the biblical thing. When we see Jesus going and tearing up the temple. That's part of it. They were doing stuff in God's house. And the earth is the Lord's and the fullness. They were doing stuff with what was God that they should not have been done. Everything is God. Everything that God blesses us with is God. So then let's then turn that around and be a blessing to other people. So let's share and not try to sell everything, okay? And then teaching. Kind of talked about with this generational care. We should be able to be taught, and then what we're taught, we should then teach other people. Because other, you never know how that could impact other people. So let's teach and be taught such that we can share the knowledge and resources that God blesses us with visiting people. I know we're limited in that capacity right now, uh, but it means the world when we visit people in person. 
particularly those who God has blessed us with that are older. Now, yes, we have biological grandparents, but then a lot of us have people that have become like grandparents to us. So not only visiting, but phone calls. Call those people. Visit those people. Just go sit with them and watch some of those old TV shows. I know it, we may not be interested in our own, but it's some good stuff in some of those, those old TV shows that they do. They'll sit there and tell you old stories that they remember. And we'll be surprised sometimes at some of the, the wisdom that we give. So visit people, call people. Now, texting is okay, but it's nothing like hearing somebody else's voice. Sometimes we text, we text stuff that should be called over the phone. Okay, so let's make sure we're making more phone calls than we are texting. Texting is cool for sharing funny stuff and pictures and all of that. But when you really want to talk to somebody, when it's possible, I encourage, call people. Call people. And we have FaceTime now. If they have that tech capability, FaceTime them so you can see and talk to each other, uh, not just text. And then something I'm big on and I believe God is big on, and we're going to really unpack it next week with household economics, family reunions, family dinners, family get-togethers, um, even, even how uh, church folk love to eat and get together. I think that's an important thing. When we look at the Bible, there a lot of times, particularly with the early church, these were house churches. So that's kind of the practice where we get from eating too kind of is a part of too. And yes, it's cultural. Uh, but there are times where they were at home, they were worshiping. Because they were home and worshiping, they also ate together. They just hung out together and enjoyed each other's presence. Family reunions, family dinners, make them a priority. Make them a priority. The joy that comes from being around family. And I know everyone, there, there may be some people saying, well, you don't know the relationship I have with my family. I, I don't. I don't. Um, but God didn't let us choose our family, and that's not, that's not an accident. We don't get to choose our parents. We don't get to choose our uncles and aunts. We don't get to choose any of that. God chooses what DNA makeup we're going to have. And when possible, spend time with your family. There may be people under the sound of my voice who uh, are adopted and things of that nature. And God is even working through that such that you have those family. And so, of course, I know there are some challenges with, with different things. But all of us have some sense of who is family. Spend time with family. Make reunions a priority. Make family dinners a priority. Make whatever traditions that your family is at, make those a priority. This, this pandemic is reminding us to do that. Now, there may be some things that we have not made a priority. There may be some things that uh, we kind of gotten away from that we need to restart. That's what, that's, that's, all, that's what God's grace and mercy is about, getting chance after chance after chance after chance. And sometimes that comes with, you know what, we've gotten away from doing this as a family. This is things that has worked for our family for generations. We need to get back to the basics. We need to get back to the fundamentals. We need to get back to doing what God wants us to do. And we have to have, we, we have, to have some integrity with that. We, we have to be honest and say, you know what, we, maybe we shouldn't have stopped doing that. We should have kept doing this. I stopped making this a priority. We stopped making this a priority. That's okay to have those conversations and be honest about it so that we can get back to doing what's really important, what really should be a priority, and not just what I want to do. Because when we do what I want to do, we're always going to end up suffering. And unfortunately, we can then impact other people and put some things on them. Okay? So again, those are just some acts of hospitality. I want to do this statement of summation, and we're done. When it is most fully realized, hospitality not only welcomes strangers, it sees in the stranger a person dear to and made in the image of God, someone bearing distinctive gifts that only they can bring. Let me say that again. When it is most fully realized, hospitality not only welcomes strangers, it sees in the stranger a person dear to and made in the image of God, someone bearing distinctive gifts that only they can bring. All of us as humans have limitations. None of us can do everything. None of us can do everything well. Even the stuff that we can do, not all of us do it really well. That's why God has created us to need other people. That's why God has allowed us to meet people that know how to do certain things that we don't know how to do and vice versa. 
And then he puts people together, he puts groups of people together, he puts communities together, such that everyone should have the opportunity for their needs to be met. Again, every person is equal in the sight of God. God loves everyone. And so everyone has all of these distinctive gifts in the body of Christ, and even when it comes to all of these different careers. Lord knows we're missing our, our uh, uh, beauticians and, and barbers right now. Look at me. I need a haircut bad. And so let's, I'm just saying that as an example of let's make sure when we get back to uh, life being quote unquote normal, that we show the right hospitality and appreciation to everyone in all of these different sectors of life, places in life, all of the people that make up uh, our communities of faith, all of the people that make up our communities in general, because again, there are all these distinctive gifts that people bring and we're missing out on. And one of the reasons I think we're missing out on is we may not have been given appreciation to everybody. We may not have been embracing everybody uh, in the way that God sees everybody. Okay, so be hospitable today. Call somebody. Text somebody. Um, when this gets over, don't just call them and text them. Go see them in person and spend time with them. It might be time to get these sleepovers back together where everybody gets in one house and stays together sometime. We, we miss out on some of this stuff. So be hospitable today, and I pray that we're hospitable going forward. So, homework. For next week, I ask that everyone read and or listen to Exodus chapter 20, and verses 12. It's a familiar verse. And as you read and, and listen to it, consider the practice of household economics. We're going to talk about uh, family and the household on next week. So again, I thank you for joining us. Uh, go be hospitable today. Be nice. It's just nice to be nice. Be nice to everyone you talk to, everyone you see. And not only today and tomorrow, but every day going forward. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, and just as God has been with us, I pray that he is with us as we depart virtually. Have a great day. Have a great weekend. I'll see you Sunday at noon. And remember, it's first Sunday, so we will celebrate communion. So have your water or your juice and have your crackers and your bread. And please, ma'am, please, sir, complete your census. I love you, and there's nothing you can do about it.